Well, it sounded like we were rounding up the crows, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. There's nothing that's worse than a quiet Baptist church. Yeah. Amen. Uh, you, you folks here just almost got as wild as the Navajos out on the reservation. <laughs> we camp meeting every year, boots fly, ties fly, everything goes, and it just goes crazy, you know? And uh, been doing, we did it for about 26 years, I guess. We just enjoy God, you know? Amen. Us Shemites, we just believe that. We're closer related to Jesus than you all. You know? <laughs> so we just want him to throw a fit every time, you know, his name is mentioned or anything said about him. We just want to throw a fit. Yes. Amen. We like that. Amen. Amen. So I appreciate it. I thank you, brother, for inviting me. Uh, we just appreciate the... Uh, uh, motel and everything that you're all doing, just a blessing. Got to go see the Golden Gate Bridge today. Uh, that's something else, you know, and yet, uh, you know, I'm thinking about how, you know, we would not be enjoying America and all these things, one for the Navajo people, helping us defeat the Japanese. Amen. <laughs> most of you, most of you might have heard about the Navajo Code Talkers. They talk like this. Yeah. He said, what the world did he say? I thank you for my brothers and sisters for the opportunity to be here with you, Brother Kim. Amen. 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 So that, that's not a hard language when you grow up with it. But you know, a lot of people can break it. You know, to, to this day, there's a lot of Navajos that still speak that language. And they, you know, uh, don't make no effort towards it. They just... Speak it, you know. And one thing about Navajo, I was kidding my daughter-in-law, you know, today. My wife said something, and I just uh, made up, uh, you know. She said, what did she say? And I said, she's cussing in Navajo. <laughs> and, and I told her, this is what she said, you know. That's not what she said. I just made it up, you know. Because there's really no cuss words in the Navajo language. Uh, when I was a, a young, saved, you know, Christian, my pastor, he about six foot four, six foot five, tall white man is what they call him, Bilagana Snez, that's a tall white man. And uh, he, he, uh, he used to take me out soul winning and knock doors. And one time we went and knocked on a door and this Navajo guy answered and he just told us to, you know, uh, go to hell in so many words with a bunch of cuss words. And we just turned around, we started walking down that, you know, sidewalk back to the car. Preacher looked at me and he said, you know what? He said, you know, he said, some white man taught him those words. That's what he said. Because he knew that Navajos don't have no cuss words. Right. And you know, and uh, the language is so rich, you know. Uh, the, the less cuss words he have, the, the more language that uh, yeah. blesses the Lord. And I think that's why God used it, you know, in, in, in World War II, you know, when the Navajos were picked. They picked the Choctaws, and I always pick on my friend, Brother Mark Wesley. He said, my people were chosen to go uh, do the coat talking. But I say, you know what? I say, it's such a big mass war that there's too many, too few Choctaws to fight the war. So he said, they called the Navajos, who right now number over 400,000 on the Indian Reservation. It's the largest in America. And uh, we got started over 39 years ago. I got on the right road, been preaching 37 of those years, Amen. and planted churches after churches. Right now, my wife and I, we just started, at the beginning of COVID, we started a church, Amen. church number eight. Never miss a church service. Still at it, still going. And you know what? The government came, threatened to shut us down. And I told them, I said, find me in the Constitution where you're allowed to do that. And our president of Navajo Nation said, I'm going to shut you down. I said, uh, what are you doing sending police over here? We, we sent police over to, to shut us down. And one of the policemen broke down and he said, I can't shut you down. He said, I'm a Christian. And I believe in what you guys are doing. So I said, I'll take a message back to the president. Tell him he, he had the guts to come over here, shut us down. Go ahead and shut us down. Uh, come on over here, you know. He never showed up. You know, as Baptists, you know, they think that, you know, we, we don't fight, we don't, you know, resist or anything like that, but that's wrong. Amen. Uh, Baptists didn't become Baptists until they took a stand. 
Amen. That the, you know, when George Washington, you know, went across the Delaware to face the British and defeat the British, you know, uh, he couldn't figure out how to do that. And he prayed, and then he asked the men to pray. And it so happened that it was a Baptist preacher that led the prayer meeting that night. And the battle was won that night. Amen. Because the next morning when they woke up, there's fog covered at Delaware. And that's how he went across and undetected and defeated the British. Yeah. Prayer works, folks. Yeah. To this day, it still works. Amen. Amen. There are a lot of people back home on the reservation whose life has been changed forever. Yeah. And living for God. And don't make no apologies for it. Amen. Amen. And I, I count it a blessing to be their brother. Yeah. Amen. I thank the Lord for that. Thank God for these uh, Bible-believing Christians that want to stand and keep on standing. Yeah. Keep fighting the good fight. Amen. Amen. I want you to take your Bible tonight, and we're going to try to stay with the thought here. My son gave out, and we're not going to talk about crows, but we're going to talk about uh, some things that uh, the Lord Jesus is known for in Mark chapter 2. I want to go ahead and go there. I want to preach a little bit here tonight. I hope uh, it will help you. I'm always uh, concerned about people not getting no help. They said, well, I went to church, your Baptist church, didn't get fed. Your problem is not the preacher. Your problem is you didn't bring a fork. Amen. <laughs> and you need, you need to come get ready to be fed. Amen. The Bible says, and again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, and so much that there was no room to receive them, though not so much as about the door. And he preached the word of God unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein he, the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and there's always that crowd. We got them today in our crowd. Amen. And, and critics, you know. And people that don't care about what God is doing. But you know, they, they have religion, just like anybody else. You know, they know what to say. Got the right words, got the right attitude. But you know what? Their heart ain't right. Amen. I tell you, that's why they're critics, you know. But you know, Baptists, critics will make you do better to do more. I like critics. I got a lot of them on the reservation. They run, when, I was, uh, uh, when I was saved, I became a King James Bible believer because the preacher that led me to the Lord said, this is the book God's hands on. Don't you ever quit it. Don't you ever compromise it. Don't you ever uh, deny it. Don't you ever question it. Don't let nobody talk you out of this book. And I remember when I started, I, I started talking about the King James Bible. And what I know about the King James Bible, when people started coming after me, and they saw, they called me fanatic. They called me this. They even called me Rugmanite. I don't even know what the rug was about. Amen. And I didn't even know who he was, you know. And I'll tell you, it was just crazy. People calling you names. Like, you, you just think, what the world these people do? You know, it's what education does for you. Yeah. You know, people get too much of that. Amen. They have no common sense. Yeah. Amen. That God wrote a book that the common man can understand. Yeah. Amen. A man in the lowest class could come and say, hey, I know what God said. Amen. Yeah. You and I tonight, we don't have to go listen to the politicians. We don't have to go listen. Hey, we don't have to die. 9-9 to psych psychology because we know how the book ends. Amen. Because he gave it to the common man. I get sick and tired of people trying to tell me that, you know, but I always tell them that, you know. Read the book. Amen. Let God talk to you. Let God talk some sense into you. Well, here the Lord Jesus showed up and uh, that's not even in my notes. I just got carried away there. Amen. But you know, uh, when... Uh, Bible said, I continue reading there, and there was certain of the scribes sitting there, and they reasoned in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies, and who can forgive sin but God only? And immediately when Jesus, perceiving his spirit that they reasoned in their, that within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason you these things in your hearts? Whether is it easy to say to the sick of the policy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk? But, they, but that you may know that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. And Amen. He, he says to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed 
and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Yeah, you know, here we read a story about the Lord Jesus Christ and His earth ministry. And you know what? Anytime the Lord showed up in the Bible, you know, the, you know always something always happened. The disease got healed. Yeah, amen. amen. People that were halt, lame, or maimed, I mean, God dealt with them and cured them. The disease got healed. The demon possessed, you know, got freed. Amen. And then only dead. But you know what? The dead got up. Amen. And thank God. What a difference Jesus makes. Amen. You go to any church service and the Lord ain't the most welcome person there. It's just a waste of time. Amen. And a lot of things that might go on. But what Jesus is able to do in a service, we call it a miracle. We call it a, a mighty work for nobody. I mean, nobody can do what Jesus can do. And here's a miracle that declares the message from God. And I want to preach to you a little bit about this thought here. It was noise that Jesus was in the house. And thank God tonight, we've already seen a little bit of that. Jesus in the house. Amen. I think over and over, every Sunday, the Lord goes by the churches and he looks in. He looks in through the door to find out people are looking for him. And I think many churches, he looks in and he says, I guess they're doing okay without me. And he just walks on by them there. Hey, he don't ever show up there, but people still go through the motions. Go through everything they do. And boy, that's a sad state. Well, we need some churches to get stirred about the Lord. Say, hey, may you be the most welcome person here. Hey, man, just stir him up. Hey, man, man nothing going on folks I'll do something to get it stirred up amen. and I want the Lord to show up people say well brother Calvin you don't say very much but when I get excited man I got something to say amen. <laughs> you know but thank God for these men that came you know when they heard the Lord was here in the midst of them Jesus was you know right there in that house and this man was absolutely paralyzed and, he, you know, it was impossible for him to get to Jesus. But thank God for his friends. Thank God for those that picked him up and took him to church. You know, you look at a man that just didn't uh, get, you know, getting in church. I wasn't raised in church, man. I wasn't even around church. But you know what? Uh, that old uh, uh, preacher that came by my house one day knocked on my door. And he told me, he said, son, I want to talk to you about something. And a big, tall, white man. I said, what are you doing here? I said, there's a bunch of nevels over here, and you're sticking out like a sore thumb. <laughs> and he said, he said, I'm here to talk to you about your soul. And I said, okay, talk to me about my soul. Really? Then he started talking about Jesus. And while he was still talking, in mid-sentence, I slammed the door on him. And I went back and sat down. And he, then the next Thursday night, I came home every evening after work, and I'd take a shower about 6 o'clock. I'd... Go sit on my uh, comfort chair and I get uh, my son to open me up a bottle of beer or something. And we sit there and I just get drunk, you know. Nobody bothered me. But on Thursday night, here he come again. He parked down the street. I was looking through that window and here he come. And I thought, here he comes. And he, sure enough, he knocked on my door. 6.30 Thursday night, he knocked on my door. And he said, this. he said, I come to talk to you. And I said, we'll talk about anything, but don't talk to me about Jesus. He said, that's who we're going to talk about. And I said, sir, we'll see you. And I closed the door. Yeah. But you know what? After a while, you know, about four weeks, you know, I started looking out. Here he come. I tell my wife, it's 6.30. Put on the coffee. <laughs> Amen. Put on the coffee. He's right on time. And he'd come in. And you know what? He'd always knock on that door. And he'd say, finally, he got to know my nose. He said, Wilson, I want to talk to you about Jesus. Boy, I'm telling you, you talk about a man. He became my friend. Yeah. But I tell you, the way he became my friend was, folks, because he cared for me. Right. He cared where I was going. He cared that I didn't know God. Yeah. But I tell you, folks, that's what it's going to take for the people around you to come to know Christ. Yeah. You must care. Amen. Yeah. Bible said, David said, he looked to the left, to the right. No man cared for my soul. Yeah. Yeah. But the Bible says that, you know what? We can cast our care upon him. For he cares for you. Yeah. We got a God that cares for us. Yeah. Amen. And thank God for this man that came, folks. He came over and over. And you know what? On the seventh week, he won there. But he came on Saturday. And I thought, this ain't Thursday. What are you doing? Two days late. He said, tomorrow I got church over here in that little gymnasium over here at the elementary school. I'd like for you to come. And I said, okay. So 
We went there, and I was kind of drunk. My, I didn't remember, but my son remembered. My wife remembered. My daughter remembered. He said, you promised that preacher you go to church. And I said, what have I done now? <laughs> I shouldn't have been drinking. <laughs> and you know what? Sunday, we got up. We got to dress. After my son and my oh, wife told me, you promised that preacher. And my son said... <coughs> Dad, you never lied before us, so are you going to lie today and not go? And I thought, oh my, I better go. So I went, and he had put a tart on the gym floor, about 25 chairs. And he was standing behind that, that little portable pulpit he had, and he was singing, trying to sing those Navajo hymns, but he couldn't even sing. He, he couldn't even carry a tune in the bucket. When he saw me come in and I kind of smiled and laughed, he, he put the songbook away and he said, that's enough singing. <laughs> he probably knew I was a critic already. Then he said, let me tell you what, he said, uh, uh, we're going to go ahead and preach a little bit. So he took out his Bible and said, who don't have a Bible? He saw me and I didn't have a Bible. So he reached down here and got a Bible and he brought it over and opened to Luke 16. He said, son, just hold it there. That'll be where I preach and you don't have to do anything. Boy, I'm telling you, he meant, that man, he preached he, he held hot that night. That morning, I, he preached it hot and heavy. Man, I wanted to make a beeline for the, for the back door. But his two boys were standing back there, and they were standing like this, <laughs> waiting for me. And I thought, man, they got me captured. I, I can't run out of here without breaking out in a fight. So I just sat there. But the thing that got me was every time he preached a point, He'd say, you might not be very, very sumptuously every day like this man, but nevertheless, sir, you're going to hell. Yeah. And then he'd come around this way and he said, you may not, uh, you know, uh, be rich like this man, but nevertheless, sir, you're going to hell. Yeah. And I looked around and there was a lady over here with a kid. There was another lady over here with two other kids. And <laughs> I was the only man there with my wife. <laughs> and I thought, he's picking on me. <laughs> he kept saying, sir. And I, got, I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to bully my way through that door. It was about that time. He said, you know, but there's hope for you. He said, this man called Jesus went to the cross of Calvary. And he said, he died for you because he loved you, sir. And I turned around and I said, he did. He said, yes, he does. And you know what? Instead of going out the door, I went to the altar while he's still preaching. And that Sunday morning... That Sunday morning, I got saved by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. 27 years old, fresh out of the military, wild as could, wild ending could be. <laughs> Amen. I went, I went, walked down that aisle, and I told that preacher, listen, how do you get saved? He told one of his boys and said, here's a songbook, son. Lead these people in the invitation. I'm going to deal with this man. You know, and he, I went down there. I went to my knee, dirty, and I got up clean. Amen. <laughs> I went up down, child of the devil. I come up, child of the king. Hey, I went down, folks. I missed, but I come up, folks, in the master's hand. And hey, I can change ever since. I got saved, amen. When I got home, folks, out of this window came the Bible, and out went the booze, amen. Hey, everything that was bad that went out the door, everything good came in. We had a one-man revival at my house, bless God. Amen. I got so excited what God done. Yeah. I went and sit down my son said, so daddy uh, you want a beer? And I said, what you talking about? Let's dump that stuff. Amen. I put him up on the sink and we start dumping that stuff on the and down to the sink, you know. And we start right then he said, daddy, I know where there's another one. Amen. You know how when you're real drunk, you know, you think you're real slick and you put all your booze where your kids don't know but they know anyway. Amen. And my son said, daddy, there's a pint over there behind the washing machine. And lo and behold, we pull it, and there it was. I said, where you been, man? I missed you a long time ago. You know, and I, then I had uh, another one under my bed, and we found all the stuff. Wow. And finally, we, we went and, uh, you know, got rid of all the booze. We, I sat down to catch my breath, and I took up a magazine out of my couch. I was looking at it. My son came up and said, Dad, look at that picture in the back. It's a picture of uh, booze. I looked at it. It was a Seagram 7 on the back of that magazine. I tore it out, and I tore it up, and I said, Son, 
I said, then I told him, I said, son, the preacher said that it's wicked from this day forward. Not going to allow none of that stuff. I said, very good. I said, son, come over here and stomp on it. Amen. <laughs> and he went to stomping on it. Our house was a mess. It looked like a tornado went through there. But folks, I had peace in my heart. Hey, I was glad God did something in my life. I'm telling you tonight, folks, uh, that's exactly what we need when Jesus comes into the house. Hey, there's one thing we need today. It is Jesus in the house. Amen. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I'm here. But you know, if we're going to get a, experience a great revival, a moving of God this week, the Lord has to be in the house. He has to, you know, the Lord will not go where He's not welcome. And the Lord will not stay where He's not wanted. Right, amen. amen. Tonight, y'all, after the service, ought to go home, find you a place somewhere and say, Lord, we sure want you. Yes. We sure need you. Yes. We can't do without you. We can't operate without you. Lord God, yes. you got to come back. you got to come meet with yes. us. Yes. Well, I tell you, uh, back home when we started that camp meeting, my people would pray seven weeks and pray. Then on the last day, about 24 hours before camp meeting, we go on a 24-hour prayer chain. And people would be crying out in the woods, up on the hills. And that first night we come and that brother sang that song. That's the first song we sing. It's called, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. And people would gather around. And you know what made the difference was on Sunday mornings prior to our camp meeting, every Sunday there would be men and women at the altar. I'll come to church at 9 o'clock. Our service starts at 10. And there'll be men and women at the altar at 9 o'clock. And these people didn't, hey, they didn't drive around the corner. They didn't live in the nice city. Hey, they live out in the country, out in the middle of nowhere. No running water, no electricity. They still came. They still come to worship God. They said, we want God here. And you know what? The first day of camping, God would show up. And I'll tell you, you get there, and man, I'll tell you, you didn't even have to, you didn't know how to preach, it didn't matter. We call on you, get up here, a sneeze, we'll get an amen, and just shout, Amen. <laughs> That's how sensitive the Holy Spirit was. I'm telling you what, for he'll tell you. Man, we met that there, you know, year after year and just seen that. But after a while, you know, it becomes something that is just kind of like normal. You begin to get over the Lord and you start meeting other preachers and new preachers come in new names and you start getting over that stuff and the whole thing starts getting cold. You say, what's going on? You know what? That's what happens. When you get into meetings where the Lord is not welcome. Yeah. And I'm telling you what, folks, these men here, they heard that Jesus was in the house. And I'll tell you, it was noise that Jesus was in the house. There's nothing more needful today than that, and no more necessary than the Lord to be in the house. Yes, you know, if Jesus is in the house, some unusual things happen. Yes, not like what David said. David said, I was glad. When they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And now the Bible talks about over there in Psalm 26, where, you know, the Bible said, David said there, you know, that uh, he preferred the house of God because, you know, that's where he's honored dwelleth. Hey, this church here, you guys just move here. Don't forget, if you want to honor the Lord, you better get the right book. You better sing the right songs. You better come with the right spirit. Better come talking to God. Right. Amen. I'll tell you what, God will move out on you if you don't. Right. Yeah. Amen. You mark her down. I've started enough church to know that people get cold on God. Yeah. And they get out and they don't ever get back in. Yeah. Hey, they might be back in the pews, but their heart is far from that. Yeah. They're somewhere else. Amen. When you're preaching, you can't even get a nod from them. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I mean, they'll go to ball games. Some of you go to Oakland Raiders, San Francisco 49ers, real popular around here. You'll go over there and sit on a cold concrete slab seat and shout her out like a Comanche Indian. And then you come to the house of God and look like a wooden Indian. There's something wrong, bless God. There's something wrong with your religion. It stinks up to high heaven. It's about time, folks, that you just cut loose for the Lord. You say, hey, somebody's going to think I'm a nut. Somebody's going to think I'm crazy. You already know you're crazy. Might as well just go ahead and enjoy God.
God, amen. There are a lot of churches where Christ is not welcome. I mean, folks, I'm glad to be here because this church obviously wants the Lord to do something this week. It's already noise that the Lord is in the house. I couldn't be preaching a better message than this. You know what? Number one, if the Lord's going to be in the house, there's got to be some things that happen. And I want to just go through this and I'll be done. Amen. Father, we thank you. We ask your help tonight. Thank you, Lord God, for the good spirit and the good preaching that's already taken place. Lord, preaching is easy when the Lord shows up. God, you can do almost about anything you want, Lord God. And I pray, God, that you'll help us tonight. We plead the blood, Father, over this place. We prayed, God, that you'd have your way in the hearts, lives of these people. God, many of these folks don't know me. But Lord, spiritually, they're my brothers and sisters, and I feel akin to them tonight because they love what I love. And they're following the one man that we believe to be right for the lives of people all across the world, including ourselves. We ask, Lord, for your presence tonight. Help us now. We pray in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Amen. The Bible says when these four men, you know, Heard about the Lord's present. I didn't think they kind of fooled around and, you know, questioned it. But you know what? The uh, Bible says that word, that straight way. That means they put everything else aside. Whatever they had pressing that day didn't mean nothing when the Lord showed up. Yes. Amen. A lot of people are like Martha, you know. They're cumbered about with so much thing when the Lord's in the house. Mary did the right thing. She said, man, just quit everything, man. There's nothing more important than kneeling at the foot of Jesus. Yes, That's, that ought to be our attitude this week. Yes, Lord, there's nothing more important than to be over here. Amen. Yes, Wherever over here is. I don't know where this place is at, but you know what? Uh, we just run around here with a GPS. Yes, That's about all we depend upon now. But I'll tell you what, folks. Uh, it's been good to end up at the right place. Yes. There's so many people in the world today, but when, you know, when these four men, they heard Jesus was here, you know, number one, they realized that, you know, there has to be a realization of God's presence. That was the first thing. Yes. His presence brought cooperation. Yeah. You know, these boys ain't Baptists, right? Baptists don't cooperate. <laughs> these four men, you know, this is the only time in the Bible where, you know, four of a kind beat a full house. <laughs> It said the house was full. <laughs> and these boys came together. Unusually, they came together to agreed on one thing. Let's get this old boy to Jesus. Yes. Let me tell you something, folks. When Jesus shows up, there's some unusual concern that takes place yes. in the lives of people. I'll tell you, I'm the only man that ever got saved out of that gymnasium service. But you know what? A week later, the preacher on Sunday reached in his pocket and took out a pair of keys. And he said, brother, you see these keys? I want you to have them. And I thought, boy, this religion's getting good already, getting a vehicle. <laughs> he said, no. He said, there's a big yellow bus behind the church, and I want you to take it back to your house and load them up with those people up there. Amen. And I thought, wow, that's what I'm supposed to do. I went into bus ministry. I didn't know what bus ministry was. <laughs> And my son and I, he'd hit the doors on a Sunday, a Saturday and Sunday morning. He'd run back to them doors, knock on them and say, We're going, you coming? And they'd load up and we'd load a whole bunch of people. Amen. We joined that church. There was about 13 people in that church when we got saved. Amen. And three years later, there was over 95 people in that church. Amen. And we went down the road and Nash City Baptist Church started a church in the library. I remember what the preacher did. So I did the same thing. Went to the library and paid the librarian $50. Said, let me have the church service every Sunday. She said, okay. So we start knocking doors, start bringing people in. And that first church was planted, boy, I'm telling you. But the thing was, folks, every time we went to knock on the door and tell people, I said, you want to meet Jesus? Yeah. And they look at you kind of funny, you know. Right. I, well, I have my own religion. Don't matter. He likes religious people too. Come on. <laughs> and we haul him in. And now we'll get saved left and right. Yeah. You know what? 
Jesus, when he's present, he makes a difference. I could have gone over there and told him, you know what? Uh, I can do this for you. I can do that for you and all this stuff. But that won't work as good as Jesus can. Amen. Just go ahead and just invite him in. Amen. And I'm telling you, God just did a work there. Started another church. Then from there's another one. My pastor got sick with cancer. And he said, son, I'm going to die pretty soon. And I think he only lived about three or four months after that. When he told me that when he was dying, he said, somebody got to take over. Somebody got to keep planting churches here. Now you know what to do. You keep at it. I was uh, 33 years old when I passed my first church. I'm 66 years old. That started my eighth work. And I'll never forget that man of God telling me that. He said this. You preach Jesus. He said, if that don't work, you don't have a sermon, you don't have an outline, just preach Jesus. People will fall in love with Jesus. Just tell them about Jesus. And that's all I've been doing. Folks, that'll work. Nothing else will work. These men hurt and they came to the house. You know, and when they came to the house, folks, these four here came and they knew, you know, that, uh, that the whole house was full. And I know, I told you, they're not Baptists because, you know what, they cooperate. But number two, they, they are not Baptists because they, not, they uncovered the roof. <laughs> the Baptists say, well, let's, too many people in church, so let's just go to the house. Yeah. We, don't, we don't need to be here. We, let's just go to another church. Uh-huh. Yeah. See, but you know what they did? They got on the roof. And more, I'm telling you what, they got into the demolition program. Yeah. <laughs> Took that roof off. Caught Jesus' attention. Bible said because of their faith, the four, he healed that man. It wasn't that man's faith. He didn't have any. He just wondered what the world's going on. People carrying me out to somebody's house. <laughs> it was those four that came, and folks, I'm telling you what, there's a realization of the Lord's presence. That's what you need to know tonight. You need to realize that the Lord must be here. Yeah. Before we can do anything, I'll tell you. Things that we ask to do, we don't quite cooperate. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. Real simple instruction. Cooperating with the Lord despite the press. Amen. That's not talking about Los Angeles Times either. (laughs) Or Oakland News. They're talking about people. Amen. And these people, despite their... You know, you can still cooperate for the Lord. First of all, it says that if any man come after me. In other words, uh, there's got to be a decision in your life that you're going to do what God told you to do. Our lives are full of decision every day. Every day we decide. You're here because you decided. Amen. I hope that you, you know, make plans to be here the rest of the week. Let God do something in your heart and your soul. Let God do a work. Amen. But you know something that the decision is something that's very important. You got to make one. Some of us today, you know, we're where we're at because we made a decision. Amen. Before I knew it, I was 66 years old and having a time in my life. That day I got saved over there 39 years ago, February 11, 1983. I haven't gotten over it yet. I haven't wore it out yet. It's still with me. I'm still shouting. That day, that day God came into our house, folks, I got churchy. I've been churchy ever since. And my son will get up sometime, he'll say, hey, I got a drug problem. He said, my dad drugged me to church Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. He said, I got that kind of drug problem I can't handle. Amen. When you get churchy, it's that way. Yes. Amen. You, get a, you never get over what God done. Yes. Folks, I've been everything. I used to be a helicopter crew chief there in the Vietnam War and I was in the military. Boy, I tell you, I hated it. I didn't know if I was going to be alive the next day. I was going to do this and that. Man, I tell you, fear overtook me all the time. You know what I did? I went to the bottle. I went to the needle. I went to the drugs. None of it answered me. When I got home, I was bitter. 
I was, uh, I was upset and bitter because my mom and dad uh, made me volunteer. I have, I'm the seventh son of seven brothers, seven boys. I'm the seventh one. All my other brothers avoided the military because there was a draft. They didn't want to enter the draft. But stupid me, I volunteered. <laughs> In a way, I was kind of forced. There was a, a, a what do you call those, uh, truant officers. He was, a, he was a juvenile officer. His name was Herman Fredenberg. He was a Menominee in and out of uh, Minnesota that married a Navajo on the reservation. He lived there, but he was a police officer. And every time something happened at the high school, he'd come over and check me out. And wanted to know, he cuffed me, take me to the jail. And he questioned me because he kind of knew that I had something to do with it. <laughs> That's how much he knew me. And one day when I turned 16, he told my daddy and my mama, he said, I need to talk to you, Lord. And he took, hauled me off to Albuquerque to the reception station. My mom and dad, he didn't talk to them. He just made them sign the paper because I was 16 to enter the United States Army. And right there, they put me on a plane and they flew me to Fort Ord, California, right down here below where it used to be by Monterey Bay. And I took 10 weeks of basic training. They didn't tell me, what do you want to be, son? You want to learn computer, son? You want to do all that? They didn't tell me that. They said, hey, maggot, we got you. You go where we tell you to go. Next thing I knew, I found myself on the other side of the coast in uh, uh, Virginia, before it used this Virginia, learning how to, you know, fly helicopters with those officers. Next thing you know, I was on a plane headed to war. Didn't have no choice. But I could choose. When the Lord called me, I could choose. I could, he, he gave me a choice. You know, there's a difference. When the Lord chose me, I went willingly. And folks, there's no discharge from his army, but I'm enjoying it. Amen. I got a message I preach about David, a little boy doing a man's job. I like that. Amen. I was herding sheep when my brothers were out doing all this other stuff. Nobody cared for the sheep. He said, you stink. Go, go in another room. They didn't like it. I had to take care of sheep. And I despised it, brother. I despise having to take care of the sheep. I despise having to do all that stuff because I said, I'm the youngest son and boy, they're giving me the sorriest job. You know, sheep stink. <laughs> yeah. Amen. They smell and they're, you know, sheep don't got no brain. You got to think for them. I'm talking about you folks now, right? <laughs> but you know what? All that stuff was training, basic training by God. To get me ready for what I was going to do. When I surrendered to do God's work, a missionary came to church and he preached a message that laid a burden on us to go step out and work with our people. And that night, I got up and went to the old fashioned altar. The reason why, because that, when that missionary was preaching, I, behind him, I heard a man by the name of Frank Rady. When I was 12 years old, I went to Whitewater Baptist Mission. And while I was sitting there, for the first time in my life, I saw a big 300-pound white man, about six foot six, stand there, and tears run down his eyes. I went to church to go and see who all the girls were going to church and see if one of them I could catch. That's why I wrote the bus. That's why I went to church. But that day, that preacher was standing there and he began to cry. It got my attention. I sat back there and I moved up a little bit to see what he was saying. And that man's up here and he's praying, got his hands up. He's praying, tears running down his eyes. And he said, Lord, I've been coming here now for 24 years. He said, trying to win these young boys and girls and Navajo kids. Would you, Lord, just have one of them just become a missionary to their own people. Would you have one of them raise up and Lord just raise them up to be a preacher for you? You know, in that day when that missionary came to church after I got saved, that's the only thing I could hear was Mr. Frank Rady weeping. And I got up and I said, I'll be that one. And you know what? Heaven broke loose because my preacher had already gone. 
And Frank Rady was already gone. And up there on the shores of glory, I uh, all shout, Hey, heaven is a loud place, you quiet folks. Some of you going to be miserable in heaven. There ain't going to be no shouting 101 class. Sh- hey, we need to learn how to shout here. Because heaven is a loud place. Heaven is where it's on, brother. When that day this boy surrendered, I believe Mr. Frank Rady, no longer 300 pounds, but a brand new body, ran down that aisle and said, Lord, he's the one that you got in there. We're going to see more people get saved. How many ever read Revelation where it says, Thousands, tens, yeah. and thousands of thousands yes. gathered around the throne. Where do you think they came from? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. They came from missionaries out there wow. winning the people to the Lord. Yeah. They're going to gather up around the throne. Hey, it's going to be a great time. It's good tonight, but it's going to get gooder. Yeah. I'll tell you. You're going to make a decision. But you know how you're going to arrive at that place where you can see God move into the house? There's going to have to be denial. He said, let him deny himself. Yes. That's hard to do, isn't it? Yes. It's not hard to deny your kids, your friends, your neighbors. It's so easy. <laughs> I mean, when my son was playing football back in high school, he said, Dad, everybody's got brand new football shoes. I need one. I said, no, you can do good with those. He said, Dad, I, I kept slipping. He was a top defensive end for the high school he was playing for. He was picked out as an outstanding end for the year. And uh, he did it with them bad shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know something? We'd go by the sporting goods store, and he looked through the window. He said, Dad, he didn't have to say nothing else. I knew he needed his shoes, brother. So he said, Dad, and I just walked by and said, No. <laughs> Just roll off the tongue, you know. No effort. It's easy to deny other people. But when it comes down to you now, you start making excuses. I've heard where the Bible says a man providing not for his own is worse than the infidel. So, Lord, I need that brand new gun. I must have that brand new one, and I'm going to sit up in the tree. You white folks are funny hunters. Find a tree and sit in there and throw corn down and wait for a deer to throw up. Why can't you hunt like the Indian way? Amen. Track him. Find him. Shoot him. Amen. I draw. I shoot. They die. But white man got to go climb a tree. And put his phone on silence and text. Hoping the deer would show up. One of the hard things to do is deny yourself. You can deny everybody else, but you can't deny yourself. You know what the Bible says? Be content with what you have. For the Lord said, I'll never leave thee and forsake thee. What happened to that verse, folks? We can't deny ourselves. But see, if you want the Lord to show up, you've got to deny yourself. These men didn't care who was there, who thought what. They just denied themselves and took up that bed. And then next of all, I want to say, there was dedication involved. He said, take up your cross daily. Dedication. Most people today in Baptist churches don't know what dedication is. They think dedication is bringing your baby here. Oh, preacher, would you dedicate my baby? What for? Stupid fool. They're going to follow you. Amen. What's the point in dedicating them? They're going to grow up to be hellions. Amen. You dedicate yourself. And that kid will turn out right. But see, what we think is we just kind of offer God a little bit of, you know, things, you know, we just indulge the Lord. Would you go ahead and dedicate this baby? I had people in my church came out of a Catholic church, got saved. and said, would you dedicate our baby? I said, No. I said, you mean we have to go back to Catholic Church and do that? Do what you want, but we're not going to do that. I said, you're not faithful. You don't come every service. Yeah. What makes you think your kid's going to do that when, you grow, when they grow up? Yeah. That they're going to follow daddy. Right, yeah. And they're going to be messed just like you. Yeah. No water, no dedication will ever change that. Amen. Right. I said, take that in your pipe and smoke it. 
And you know what? Later on, he come back and said, "Brother, I'm sorry. You're right. I read my Bible. And I, you're right." Yeah. See, we don't we don't dedicate babies at our church. Amen. Amen. Why would you want to do that? Well, they didn't even have sense enough to know the right from wrong. They're gonna follow Daddy. Your kids will be as spiritual as you are, or as wicked as you are. Amen. That's just basic knowledge. Amen. I know some Baptist preachers whose kids are just a bunch of hell-raising kids. And they'll get up and they'll say stuff and they'll quote verses. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, that, that don't even punch. You know why? Because your kids ain't right. Yeah. And they're telling on you. I had, a, I had a girl that said, I hate my daddy. He's a preacher. I hate him. I said, why do you hate him? Because you don't know what he does at home. And I said, I'm not going to ask another question. I'm just going to pray for him. I said, I, I'm sad to hear that. But you know, dedication is something that's very important. He said, take up your cross. Jesus took up his cross. You have a cross. He said, take up your cross. So it has to be voluntary. It's not going to be forced. Jesus' cross was voluntary. He willingly took up the cross and carried it up Calvary. You got a cross, you got to willingly carry it for the Lord. Yeah. Not only is it voluntary, but it's vicarious. The Lord carried it for somebody else. He carried it for you and me. Yeah. We got to carry our cross for other people. Right. He didn't say wear the cross, jerk that thing off. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Some of you got that little bitty cross down in, under your shirt <laughs> with a few peach fuzz coming out and coming in a little bit. <laughs> he didn't say wear it, he said bear the cross. Yeah. You know what? Most people don't want to do that. But you know what? If you do that, you'd be surprised how your kids will turn out. God will do that if you just obey Him. Amen. Yeah. To deny yourself, take up your cross dedication. Then He said, follow me. That's determination. Man. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many of us are determined to finish this race. Mm -hmm. yes. Finish what God gave us to yeah. do. Yeah. Like I told you, I started when I was young. Here I am, you know, 60, almost coming to 70. And I have had the best time in my life. And you know the best part about that, brother? I haven't missed nothing. Amen. That book has kept me up to date. Amen. I don't even watch the news no more. I quit watching the news. Amen. Amen. I mean, who likes to get their Amen. news from a fox? <laughs> what crazy people we live with. I'm going to turn to fox. I wonder what fox was. And back home... The only thing fox are good for is to kill our chickens and yeah. our sheep. So we kill them. Yeah. Got my little sidearm. Amen. Amen. Wear it every morning. <laughs> Work outside with my chickens and my cows and my livestock. And I'm always worried. Them coyotes and them foxes. Yeah. And I said, you come near me. I don't miss. <laughs> the other day, one of our own dogs took the head off our chicken. Mm -hmm. She stuck her head through the wire fence and the, the little... Uh, uh, Boston Terrier came and just nipped that head off. She's still carrying it. And my wife says, kill him! Kill him! So I got my gun out and I switched hand. And I just stood there and I went... Tow, tow, tow. <laughs> my wife said, how come you miss? You never miss! I said, I'm sorry, dear, but I'm out of bullets. I tried. <laughs> then my son called. And I told my son, I said, don't tell mom. I love that dog. <laughs> Now, if it was a fox, I'd have killed him dead. <laughs> Amen. But you know what? People today get all their news and everything from all these crazy things. And that's why our churches are dying. That's why we're not excited. We don't get stirred up about the things of God no more. Amen. And we want to say, not only realization of his presence, but notice the manifestation of his power. When Jesus got all those people together, it's, the Bible says, and he preached. The word Amen. unto them. Boy, I'm telling you, I appreciate preaching, don't you? Amen. I enjoy the singing and all that and get the feel goods and the willy willies and all that stuff. Yeah. But I like preaching. Yes, sir. Every church we started, every church we built, we built on preaching. Yes, we didn't send the kids to, you know, outside to play. We didn't send them to kids' church. We don't even believe in kids' church. Mm -hmm. Show me that in the Bible. We just get them all in here and preach the hell out of them. Every service. 
I got a young pre that preacher that he was talking about that. He started working with Winslow. Came right out of our church. Nobody believed that there'd be a preacher. But Martin McGahey came to preach our youth camp. And he said, Brother Calvin, take off your boots and put it up here. I'm going to close now. When he started closing that, he said, who's going to fill these boots? Who's going to fill these shoes? His message was, who's going to fill these shoes? And Jonathan got out and walked down there. And he prayed over them boots, my boots, for almost 35 minutes. There was tears on the boots when I got them, put them on. Amen. It don't surprise me tonight. He's pastor in one of the churches on the reservation. The furthest away. Doing a good job. Amen. Sticking with the stuff. Amen. Amen. He's him and uh, Brother Gary Oz, he said. We heard of Brother Kim. We want to meet him. Is he as crazy as they say he is? <laughs> they want to know. These Navajos want to know. Come out here and just enjoy what God has done out here. But you know something? These men would have not been in love with God if we didn't preach to them when they were kids. Yeah. Gary Ozzie took the church, the last church I started, Calvary Baptist Church. He took that church. Now, three years ago, you know what? Where Gary, where God found Gary, his mama gave him birth and she went to the Chinle trash dump and dumped him there. But her, his uncle was watching. And when, her, when his sister left, he went over there and picked up that baby. And he took it to his mama. And Gary was raised by his grandma, away from the mama. Today, he's preaching the gospel, passing the church. Amen. Not bad for a boy that's been thrown away, right? Yes. See, God can do that. That's why you need to get him in the house of God. Yes. Preach to them. Amen. I have never apologized, preached to young people. They take it when the old deadheads can't handle it. Some of you can't handle the preaching, but I tell you, those kids love it. You ask my son, they gather around me and they hug me and they say, Preacher, we love you. I got one now that's grown up and folks, he sends me $100. Every, every two weeks, he sends $100. And then I got another one, you know, that's always uh, calling me and telling me, How are you doing, Preacher? I lost a kidney here, right in the midst of COVID. I lost a kidney. They found cancer in my kidney. I went to the hospital. I thought, I wasn't going to make it. I was so sick. And I thought, man, this is it, Lord. The only place I could look was up when I was laying on that bed. And I said, Lord, I did some talking to the Lord. But the Lord showed me, not in the, you know, literal sense, but, you know, spiritual sense, he said, I'm not through with you yet. You're going to get up. Yeah. And I got up. Three days later, I had the operating table, walked away, walked out. Terrence's first daughter, my granddaughter, stayed with me with my wife in that room. She wept all the time that she was there. But she wasn't weeping in vain or afraid to lose that. She was praying for God to intervene and do something. Because the, the doctor told me, he said, three things will happen. Either you, uh, he said, either you're going to uh, get well after I operate on you, number two, or you go in a coma, or number three, he said, you're going to die. And my granddaughter got him and said, how about the fourth one? He said, what is that? He said, the fourth one. He goes, always four when the Lord does something like here. Then he's the fourth man to fire. And my granddaughter <laughs> told the doctor, he said, what about Jesus? He left him out. Yeah. Jesus could raise him up. And that day when the Lord, that day when the Lord raised me up, walked out of the hospital, my, my granddaughter walked by me and that doctor came and he said, see you later, sir. And then she said, see? <laughs> he probably didn't see, he was a heathen anyway. But you know what? When people listen to preaching, it builds their faith up. Yeah. Well, you know what? Amen, they, they know that God's going to do something. And I'll tell you, then right after that, I got a heart attack. And God spared me from that heart attack. Right now, I've got back surgery coming again, and I'm trying to lay the other one. I already had one. I got another one. You know, I told the Lord, I said, don't take me piece by piece. Take me, just take me. But don't, give, don't take piece by piece. And the Lord said, I won't. But 
I got to do this. You know, God, God's got his way of dealing with his servant. But I'm telling you, I appreciate the power of God. Amen. That is in the midst of our people, in the midst of God's people. You know, the reason why is because of the preacher. As long as we stick with the preaching, God's going to do something. And then, let, you know what? When he, when he preached, you know what he did? He produced an unusual concern by these four men. He also did, had some undying conviction. They didn't stop just because they were pressed. They didn't stop because somebody was in the way. They went on and took an alternative route and tore the roof off and got that man to Jesus. Undying conviction. We're, we're, we're short on that today. Amen. You know what? I told, my, I told you this. My preacher told me years ago, he said, Brother Calvin, get as many convictions as you can. He said, because the older you get to be a Christian, the more you're going to lose. He said, you're going to lose some of them. And we're there, folks. Yes. I preached down here at San Diego, at Barona Indian tribe. I preached down there at that tribe. They didn't have a pastor. They didn't have a church. The governor, I mean, the chief of the church, uh, the chief of the uh, tribe had closed the church. He couldn't allow nobody in because a Baptist preacher, white man, had taken that pulpit there and in just a short few weeks he had defiled the pulpit by defiling himself with some of the women in the church. And the preacher, you know what? That chief went up there and he locked the door. He said, it's fornication in here. We're not, no, let no Baptist preacher in. I went down there and I asked him if he could let me in. He said, we're not letting no Baptist preacher in here again. And as I decided to walk away, a boy came up in a wheelchair and he was paralyzed from the neck down. And he came up and he was just going, oh, oh, oh. You know, he couldn't really talk. So the guy that was pushing the wheelchair with him in, in, kind of intervened there and he was telling him what to say and he was telling me. And this is what that young man said. He said, I was 17 years old. I said, I had a, he said, I had a fastball of 92 mile an hour. And he said, the San, San Diego Padres drafted me to become their pitcher. This was that Indian boy. He was little tall. And he said, right before that happened, I had surrendered my life to preach and be a pastor in this church. He said, my dad was pastor of this church, and then he gave it up to be the chief. And he said, here I am. God's already set me in. He said, I, I walked away from God. He said, while we were playing the Texas Rangers, he said, I wound up on the mound and I threw a fastball. And he said, I followed that fastball in my face because I got a stroke. Whoa. And my career ended before it began. Here I am laying in church. He said, tears run out of his eyes. He said, the greatest blessing in my life that God ever answered my prayer was God would send an Indian preacher to preach to us. Wow. And there I stood and I preached to those people. We opened, the the uh, chief opened the doors back and we went in there. And then some people came over from uh, Duck Fisher. His church, he came over. His son came over, Jonathan. And he got all stirred up in the preaching. He said, I've never heard preaching like that. I said, your dad's known all over. He said, he don't preach like that. Yeah. And then this is what he said. My pastor here, he said, he he's don't have the standards that you have. And he, tonight he didn't come because he got offended. I said, we're not at a beach party. You boys put back on your pants. Nobody wants to see your skinny legs. <laughs> I was preaching. And that preacher was wearing shorts. He didn't even look like a pastor. Amen. And he got up and he left and he didn't come back the rest of the week. Then he texts me. You know how you don't like somebody? You get real yeah. bold and I want to tell him this, you know. <laughs> so so happened that we went back and I saw him. I said, come here, boy. I want to talk to you. Look at me in the eye. I said, I may not whip you, but I said, I've got two men with me that whip you if you come after me. But I'm going to tell you this. I said, you're a man of God. And what you do, people will do. You lower that standard. Yep. Yep, that's right. See, that's what people do. Yep. If I told you here tonight, hey, I can clear, you know, the uh, high jump bar. I can go over there and I can jump that high bar every time. I'll just clear it. It'd be nothing, man. I walk away and say, Look at me. 
And then you say, well, how in the world can you jump that? Because you know what? It's that two foot. <laughs> you say, I'll, I'll, I'll keep jumping that two foot. That's my standard. That's the way people are. Baptists have lowered their standard. And they look good. But you know what? It makes God mad. What did Dr. Ruckman say? He's coming. And boy, is he mad. He's got that right. He is mad. Folks, we live in church where we learn how to play church. Amen. When I got saved, I went to Colorado to be uh, to a camp meeting. There was an old man of God. I can't remember his name, but he got up there to preach. Cowboy preacher. He had a big cowboy hat. He took it off. He got up there to preaching. Boy, I'm telling you, I, I had goosebumps all over. And the guy that's sitting next to me, he'd say, Hey, man! And I look over there. Then the guy over here says, Hallelujah! You know? <laughs> and, and then I noticed that they were timing it. When the preachers stop, they throw in there. So then I said that, you know, next time he did that, I said, hey, man. <laughs> and the preacher over here looked at me and said, son, was that you? I said, yes, sir. He goes, boy, you're going to be a good, good Christian. You're going to help any preacher. Just, just keep it up. By the end of the week, man, I was wondering, oh. I was shouting. I was getting excited about God. I was wondering what they were getting excited about. Well, I found out it was Jesus. Amen. The more I read about him, man, he's worth shouting, running for, getting carried away for. Amen. Amen. This old boy got carried to the church, but he walked back with the bed on his back. Amen. You know, the world says, you made your bed, sleep in it. Yeah. You know what Jesus says? Take up your bed and walk. Yeah. <laughs> and then they said, we never saw it on this fashion. Yeah. There was the presence of God. There was the preaching. There was the pardon. And then here, there's the praise. Yeah. They begin to shout. Yeah. Can you imagine when Jesus wrote into Jerusalem and the Bible says there, you know, Hosanna to the highest. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And you see that little boy over here. Woo! Hey Amen! That's right! That's him! That's him! And the Pharisees says they showed up. Boy, shut up. What are you trying to carry on for? We're trying to watch a parade here. What are you doing? And the boy says, I can't help it. I can't help it. Shut up. Amen. You know what? Jesus took my lunch. Yes. And some fishes went down to the seaside. Amen. And he fed multitudes. I still haven't got over it yet. Hey, I still got several baskets at my house to prove to you that he can do a miracle. That's why I shout. Yes. And the Pharisee says, oh, don't mind him. He's just a kid. Then all of a sudden, here's a lady. And she said, Lord Jesus, bless you, yes. oh, son of David. And they said, what are you doing? Are you just... She said, I was, you know, incurable. Yeah. Yeah. You know, blood was issuing out of me. And that day I heard Jesus come by. And I was so excited that I wanted to go. When I got there, she said, man, I needed to touch him. I need him to heal me. So I got that and the crowd was everywhere. There was that press again. And she said, I just got on my knees and crawled as far as I could. Then I reached in there, just oh, as far as I can, just barely touched the hem of his garment. And the blood stopped. Amen. And I got up. I got healed. Yeah. Hey, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Praise him. She started shouting. You know what? That didn't end there. Another guy got up and said, Amen! Praise the Lord! What a great God we have! He just showed up here. Listen to him. He said, Who wants to listen to you? Be quiet. Said, Who are you now? He said, I'm Lazarus. I was dead. Yeah. He picked me up. Listen, folks. No matter where you're at tonight, you need the presence of God in your life. And you know what? If you're here tonight and you're lost, you need his pardon. He pardoned the sick man. And that boy went home different the way he came. Listen, when Jacob wrestled with that angel and God dislocated his hip or broke his hip, whatever you want to believe, Jacob, after meeting with God and wrestling with him, had a different walk. Amen. Amen. That limp reminded him that, you know, God did something on him that he'll never forget. 
don't know about you, but February 11, 1983, God did something for me I'll never forget. Yes. I'm here tonight. Amen. I've traveled all over the country, all over the world, just telling Amen. people about what God done for me. Amen. And I'll keep doing it as long as the Lord lets me live. Amen. How about you tonight? Are you looking for his pardon? How about the preaching that the Lord does? I mean, there's nobody can preach like him. Twelve years old. He's in the midst of doctors and lawyers. And the Bible said they're asking him questions. How old are you anyway? Jesus said, well, my mama's side, I'm 12 years old. I said, on my daddy's side, I'm from eternity. And they said, uh, who, who, who's your daddy anyway? He said, on my mama's side, they said, Joseph is. But he said, on my daddy's side, he's the God of heaven. Yes. Where are you from anyway? He said, uh, on my mama's side, I was born in Bethlehem. But on my daddy's side, I've always been. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, I'll tell you, that gets you stirred up. Yes, sir. It still stirs me up. Here I am, you know, 39 years in the Lord, and it can still get excited. Yes, How about you? Even if he just let out a grunt, he understands. <laughs> See, Baptists are that way, huh? No. Like I said, a bunch of you were passed for a good wooden ending. Let's get, it, get loose and just let God do something down in your soul. Amen. My message is ended. Bow your heads. We're done preaching tonight. The sick of the palsy received pardon. He received healing. You know, there's a lot of things that happen here when the Lord showed up. This week, we should pray that the Lord would do something. And we see some things happen this week. Father, we ask you to bless this time of invitation. Maybe someone here tonight is lost, don't know Jesus as their personal Savior. God, I pray that they'll come and, Lord, that they'll ask you to come into their heart and save them. God, thank you for that precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot, without blemish. Lord, you're still saving people today, and that blood was shed over 2,000 years ago, but it has never gone bad. It's still effective. It is still working in the lives of people that come and turn to you. I pray now, Lord, tonight that you work in our midst. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your blessing upon our lives. I love you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.